Well, welcome back. It's actually still Saturday the 15th, but it's nearly Sunday the 16th, so we'll probably be watching this on, on Sunday. Now, um, a few weeks ago on this channel, we talked about the fact it's about five, six weeks ago now, we predicted that things are likely to become endemic. And um, I, I was there wasn't too many people saying that at the time, but I want to j- just show you many other people that have now come on board with this thinking. Um, but before we do that, um, I just want to flag up some interesting uh, graphics. Now, these are from our world in data. Um, how do key COVID-19 metrics compare to the early peak, uh, the, the early 2021 peak, the previous peak? Now, these are quite clever because they've taken 100% as being the peak here. So that means that anything above this is higher than the peak in uh, December, January let's say January 2021, and uh, anything below that is less. So it's actually quite clever. And not only that, each metric is shown as a percentage of its peak value in 2021 and is shifted to account for the uh, observed delay between case confirmation, hospitalisation, ventilation and death. So they've actually taken these parameters and shifted them an appropriate amount. Now, they don't say on our world in data how much they've shifted them, but we can assume it's... Um, we can assume it's about 10 days from infection to um, any complications and about two weeks to uh, ventilation and about three weeks or more to death. It will be something around there. So what this actually means is we can actually kind of re- read these in, in, um, in th- that's the link to them there. It means we can actually read them in kind of, um, I don't want that one. I want uh, that one it means we can actually kind of read these almost in live time when we can compare all the parameters because we've actually shifted for the delay. So it's quite clever, really. I must say, I thought about doing this myself, but it's, it's, it's actually a bit complicated and never quite got around to it. So so I'm pleased they've actually done it. So so let's look at some of these now. And this is showing really that, that, that um, the Omicron is so much less virulent and so, so anyway, the, the, they were the cases there in uh, the peak. In this is this is this is for the UK. Um, so we see that all 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 things went up to that. Well, obviously they all went up to one hundred percent. So we would expect them all to be the same. Um, but now we look at confirmed cases. So first of all, we see that the UK has peaked, but what a high level it peaked at, <laughs> way higher than previous. <coughs> and the percentage there is what is it? Uh, th- three times, three times, 300 percent. But then when we go down and look at the other parameters, the patients in hospital, yes, it's up a bit, but it's only at 50 uh, percent of what it was at the previous peak. Confirmed deaths round about the 20 percent and patients ventilated. Uh, again, we haven't seen a rise in patients ventilated. So um, all of those weigh less than previous peaks. Now, that's for the United Kingdom. Uh, this one is for England, which gives a fairly similar, a fairly similar picture for England. Looking at the cases there, going up to 250, 260 percent. And if we look at Scotland, where they did have more um, restrictions, we find out that with more restrictions in Scotland, they had way more cases. So 250 percent times the cases in England. And Scotland, where they had actually more restrictions. Um, I mean, if you if you don't live in the UK, um, what actually had, tends to happen here is that the the UK government makes particular recommendations, and then the, the the Welsh and the Scottish governments. I think I don't want to be over cynical, but it looks like they'd want to be just a little bit different from the English, so they change things a bit. So the Scottish government and the Welsh government had greater restrictions, but they've had massively more cases. So I think the more serious scientific point here is that these increased restrictions in Scotland uh, have actually not helped at all. And in fact, the cases in Scotland there are over 600 percent, whereas in England it was only 250 percent. So this shows just how transmissible Omicron is and and the restrictions they've put into place in Scotland patently uh, have not worked. Yet there's been all the social and economic inconvenience of that, but they patently patently haven't worked because Omicron is so transmissible Uh, as indeed we did predict at the time uh, it has to be said 
Uh, now that's Scotland. What's this one? Oh, this one is Germany. Now Germany was recovering. Um, Germany was recovering from a delta wave. So some of this in Germany would be uh, would, would be delta, but now it's definitely Omicron. So we can see that the cases now are way higher than they were at the German peak. This is compared to the German peak, which was. Um, Oh, it was a bit, a bit earlier. German peak there was, um, oh no, no, it's around about the same, isn't it? It's around about the same, it's around about the same time, actually. So uh, as we see now, cases going way high with Omicron and these are going to continue to increase in Germany. They're still in their uh, very exponential increasing phase. But patients in ITU, as Omicron has gone up, so as Omicron has gone up, and remember this is adjusted for the time delay, so as Omicron has gone up, patients in ICU have gone down, hospital admissions have gone down, and confirmed deaths have, have gone down. And, and now they, they are way lower th than they were before. So th that illustrates there very clearly in Germany. So what we see there is, um, and again, as we predicted, Om Omicron has, is displacing Delta and is associated with less hospitalizations, less deaths and less patients being ventilated. It's almost as if Omicron is protecting us against the uh, ravages of Delta. Well, it's not almost as it, uh, almost like that. It actually is that. It's really quite, quite, quite incredible. And, and, and we know that Omicron gives immunity against Delta as well. So it's, um, yeah. So whatever you make of that, that's the data. If you don't want to accept my uh, interpretation there, you have to accept the data, I'm afraid, because that's... Well, unless the Robert, it's from straight from the Robert Koch Institute. Uh, where's next? Uh, that is Spain. Wow. A confirmed cases in Spain, straight up. Not as high as Scotland, it has to be said. Um, now, cases still going up there. And, and unfortunately, we are seeing hospital admissions, ICU admissions and confirmed deaths going up slightly in Spain. But there again, they weren't replacing a delta like they were in Germany. So... Uh, there's just about nothing there in Spain. The, the, the levels are very low. Whereas in Germany, we'd add that uh, we'd add that Delta problem uh, that is being replaced. So the, the numbers are going down. So even although the Omicron is causing less hospitalizations, admissions, and uh, intensive intensive care ventilations, the sheer volume of cases is having some some effect in the Spanish data. Uh, Israel, again, massive increase in cases. And again, they've gone from just about nothing. Israel had gone back to... No actually, actually, Israel had gone back to normal twice, really, there and there. <coughs> so uh, they're, they're basically they're going from nothing, as they did in South Africa, <coughs> rather than replacing... <coughs> rather than replacing Delta. So um slightly different situation there. But also, we can, but we still clearly see that the levels there are way, way lower than their their peaks were. So they're the only uh, countries that our world in data is actually done in that format. But I thought that was remarkably uh, interesting and quite clever. Hopefully, they'll get down round to doing to one for the states and other countries now. Now, I've had lots of questions about this next one, this next point. Um, Dr. Uh, Cal, 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 Calviri is from the European Medicines Agency. And lots of people have been saying to me that he has said that repeat vaccinations, um, consecutive boosters, will actually reduce the quality of the immune response. Now, he did have a video that was taken down from the European Medicines Agency. This is from a press conference. So whether it was on that or not, I don't know. That that's taken down. What is available now is on is on uh, the, these sites here. And uh, so what's available now uh, that Dr. Calvary has said. Uh, this is what is currently on record as saying. Whether he's backpedaled a bit, we don't know because the. Uh, I couldn't get to the original uh, video that I wanted. But here he's saying boosters can be done once, in other words, the third dose, uh, or maybe twice that would be a fourth dose, but not is not something we can think should be repeated constantly. So it doesn't actually say there that the immunity is reduced. 
So it leaves that possibility open, but it doesn't actually say they, that multiple uh, vaccines have an immunosuppressing effect. As I say, if it, is, if it does say that, it's no longer in the, in the public domain. Um, we, we, need, we need to think about how we can transition from the current pandemic setting to a more endemic setting. Yes, of course. Uh, we agree with that. Uh, with Omicron, there will be a lot of natural immunity taking place on top of vaccination. And this is, of course, true. So it looks like there's going to be, well, there is huge amounts of natural immunity following in the wake of Omicron. So um, will that mean that future vaccinations are unnecessary? Uh, I would very strongly hope that is the case. I strongly suspect that is the case. So he is agreeing with that. Uh, we will be fastly moving to a scenario which is close to endemicity, becoming endemic in other words. These are direct quotes. English isn't his first language, so it's pretty good. Fourth dose for all data has not been generated to support this approach. So he's not saying here, he's not actually saying this hampers immunity. He's saying there's no data to support its efficacy. A repeat vaccination in a short time frame will not uh, represent a sustainable long term strategy. So he's saying it's not a good, it's not sustainable long term from this. He's not actually saying that is actually uh, immunosuppressing to have extra doses of vaccine. I was, I was asked this on a TV interview recently. The, the guy said, uh, do, do increased vaccines actually have an adverse effect on immunity the same way as you can get antibiotic resistance? And I said, well, as far as I know, not. But then lots of you wrote in and said, is this what this guy is saying? The, 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 this doctor from the European Medicines Agency, the vaccine doctor, Dr. Calvary. And from what we have in the public domain now, no it's not what he's saying. It's just saying it's not a practicable way forward and there is no evidence that it would be beneficial. So that is what is in the public domain. Now, if it changes and he comes out and says it's actually harms immunity to have further vaccine doses, then, of course, that would be something we'd take an interest in. Now, the endemic uh, COVID very soon thing that we've been talking about for five, six weeks now on the channel, we're roughly on the time scale we uh, suspected we were on. Uh, very soon, um, basically we've peaked already in the UK. United States will be peaking in the next couple of weeks. Doesn't mean say hospitals aren't going to be a problem well into February. They are in the United States, especially for reasons we've already looked at. So Omicron is going to become endemic, at least for the next few seasons. Um, now, endemic means it's consistent and predictable, not what you might. So you want it to be consistent and predictable as opposed to the boom and bust we've had uh, lately so we're not quite there yet because it's not totally predictable although we have predicted it reasonably well actually for some time now but um they, they, these are what the official um doctors are saying the professors and things common common cold influenza hiv measles malaria tuberculosis all endemic smallpox was of course but that's been eradicated so we have lots of other endemic diseases and they can cause significant problems i mean measles Last time I checked, um, measles was the seventh most common cause of death in children in the world, in poorly vaccinated areas especially. So um, endemic does not mean not severe, uh, by no means. It just means it's there all the time and pops up from time to time. Tuberculosis, big problem, lots of tuberculosis in poorer areas of the country. So we're going to enter a new endemic uh, COVID era. This is what I believe is going to happen. Now, is this just me or of other academics uh, or, or professional people who do this all the time? Um, uh, do, do they agree with this now? Well, th th they're coming around to it. Professor Julian His Hiscox, Chair of Infectious Global Health, Liverpool, uh, U UK, new and emerging respiratory viruses, New and Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group. So the, in other words, uh, this professor is a member of the UK government officially uh, official advisory group on new uh, viruses, which, of course, was set up uh, in the uh, in response uh, to the pandemic rather than being proactively set up. Uh, so anyway, this professor is saying we're almost there now. It's the beginning of the end, at least in the UK. We, we, we agree. In fact, we're, we're, we're into the end game now, I believe. 
I think life in 2022 will be almost back to before the pandemic. I agree. Uh, should a new variant or old variant come along, for most of us, like any other common cold coronavirus, you'll get sniffles and a bit of a headache and then we are OK because we have such high levels of immunity. Um, if you're willing to tolerate zero COVID deaths from COVID, then we're facing a whole raft of restrictions and it's not game over. And I don't want to misrepresent here what Professor um, Professor Hiscox is saying. So I've put it as a direct quote. But what he's saying is, what he actually means here, that if the government wants zero COVID, then we're going to have big problems. We have to have massive restrictions if you want zero COVID. But if people aren't exposed to the ongoing Omicron, they're not going to develop immunity to it. So, so, so basically what he's saying is we have no choice. The government governments cannot opt for zero COVID. In China at the moment, they're trying to. Um, let's be quite clear about it. The zero COVID policy in China will fail. It is not possible with Omicron to have a zero policy. Everyone in China is going to be exposed to uh, Omicron in the next few months unless the country is uh, completely closed down, but then we'll get deaths from starvation and all sorts of other problems. It is inevitable. We have to accept the circulation of Omicron. It, it, uh, it'd be nice not to have it, but, you know, we have to accept the circulation of the common cold. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't say, wham, all colds have disappeared. It just can't happen. Um, so I think I think that's, that's what he's saying there. So it's not game over if we want to go for zero COVID, but we can't. In a bad flu season, two to three hundred die a day over winter and nobody wears a mask or socially distanced. And, and this is true. We, we, why have we been tolerating this for so long? All we've been doing is kind of promoting vaccination programs. Um, and that's perhaps a line to draw in the sand, two to three hundred deaths a day. Is that what we're prepared to accept? Probably. Um, but, but, but it's not quite as callous as that. Let, let's go and see what other um, scientists are thinking, see if their thinking's coming round. Uh, this is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Uh, Gora Pelli, a virologist at George's University, uh, who is uh, very optimistic. We'll soon be in a situation where the virus is circulating. We will take care of people at risk, but for anyone else, uh, we accept we will catch it. They will catch it. I agree completely. And your average person will be fine. Yeah, it, it is quite inevitable. So interesting to see all these people are now coming round to what we've been saying for five or six weeks. We need to accept the fact that our flu season is also going to be a coronavirus season, I agree, at least for the next few years, and is going to be a challenge for us. However, it is still uncertain how bad winters will be. The people who die from flu and COVID tend to be the same. And, and I've put a note there, you, you can't die twice. So the people that are vulnerable, that are more likely to die from COVID, are perhaps the people that have been dying from flu, influenza and its complications in previous years. Um, it's the same basic people that are at risk. And as, as uh, COVID becomes endemic and Omicron becomes endemic, then perhaps the risks are going to be comparable. So I'm not expecting a doubling of, of death rates. I'm not expecting the deaths from influenza to be added to the deaths from uh, COVID. Because it's the same group of people that are vulnerable and any one individual can only die once. Therefore, they can't appear in the figures twice. And we're not going to lose more people than we otherwise would, would be with hope. And I think that actually makes quite a lot of sense. Um, Professor uh, Gani, <laughs> I should have practised all these names, shouldn't I? Uh, anyway, p p epidemiologist, Imperial College London. COVID will still be around, uh, but we're no longer going to need to restrict our lives. I think we can get back to normal soon. It seems like it's taken a long time, but only a year ago we started vaccination and we we're already an awful lot freer because of that. That's true. That's true. It just seems like a long time. But it's only a year, just over a year since we started vaccination. Uh, and a new variant can out, uh, a new variant that can outcompete Omicron and be more pathogenic is possible. But it is not likely because to have 
a variant which was even more pathogenic than Omicron. So, so even more. So, forget that last sentence. To 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 have, to have a variant which is more transmissible than Omicron is remarkably unlikely, and the probability that you would get something that was more transmissible than Omicron. That, that had immune escape from previous immunity and was more pathogenic, the, the probability of all of those three mutations happening in the same virus is so unlikely and probably is not genetically possible, probably not genetically possible. So I, I think the sheer transmissibility of the Omicron variant is going to protect us from future variants for a period of, of time. I am optimistic about that. Uh, Professor Eleanor Riley, Immunologist, University of Edinburgh. Uh, when Omicron has finished and moved through, immunity in the UK will be high at least for a time. That, there you go. I mean, so b basically the, the, all the main brains are now agreeing, um, to be quite honest with what we've been saying for, for some time about the optimism of Omicron. Now, just a couple of your experiences here. Um, uh, I'm not going to uh, mention the name, but someone who describes himself as being 70 years old, overweight male, who used to smoke for a lot of years. Uh, Hi, John, I'm going through a period of suffering. Sorry to hear that. Um, got the infection last Tuesday. Uh, tested on Wednesday and was positive. It is what you describe, but the sore throat is terrible. You don't realise how often you swallow and how much it hurts until it's torture to do so. I've been taking my D3 and zinc, which is good. And uh, quite a touching comment here. Uh, and if nothing else, my new uh, granddaughter will get to know her granddad, which, of course, is the way it should be. What quite a lot of people are telling me, as you said in your experiences, Quite a lot of people are saying they actually get better for a while and then get worse. So it seems to follow, you know, they'll wake up in the morning and not feel too good. Then they'll, lunchtime they'll feel pretty good. Uh, think, oh, I'm over this. But then by, by bedtime they can be feeling pretty rough again. So um, it does seem to follow this relapsing and remitting course, usually but for a fairly short period of time. Uh, now let, let's go on to... Uh, uh, m m m miss end place um when i uh when i woke up and feeling like i had a hangover i immediately took my temperature and sure enough it was 37.8 so woke up just feeling pretty rough as if you'd had a, a bit of a heavy night knew i had it just needed confirmation performed a lateral flow test and bang had a positive result in under five minutes no really, out, no really outstanding symptoms, no sore throat, no real headache, just the tightness of the head, just like a hangover. Temperature fluctuated hour to hour. Taste buds altered, but no loss, just altered. Basically, uh, a general feeling of being unwell, but resolved. Uh, I haven't got the next piece of paper, but from what I remember, it resolved in, in about three days. So there you go. Um, Good to get some of your experiences. What we are seeing with Omicron is a fairly variable, a fairly var Some of you having quite a rough time. Other others uh, are um, minimally symptomatic. Um, I, I assume I've had it because I've been exposed. Uh, maybe just asymptomatically. Uh, all the time I've done a test, I've it's never come up on a test, so I've never tested when I've been uh, when I've been positive. But but um. Quite a few of you are 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 are, are reporting these symptoms. The 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 the, uh, the, COVID, the COVID symptom tracker symptoms do seem to be pretty accurate. But some of you are feeling pretty rough, uh, ill. Um, so some of you actually feel pretty awful for for uh, a few days. But most people do seem to be recovering quickly. And we know from official data that hospitalizations and intensive care and deaths are way lower, as we saw on those graphics, than previous. Waves, so really, really useful graphics. Those, I think, I think that's um, that actually really helps quite a bit. That it just puts it into context of how uh, lucky we are that this is so less pathogenic. Uh, how fortuitous it, fortuitous it is that it's giving back protection against Delta, and therefore, because people who have had Omicron are immune to Delta. 
Delta is essentially almost, almost gone now. It's just a, a, a percent, a few percent, uh, and it will be gone completely in the next uh, week or two. And do remember, a lot of the problems that we're having with current hospitalizations and deaths are hangovers uh, from from the from the previous Delta wave that we experienced. So um, reasons to be optimistic, and good to see that lots of uh, professors and doctors of immunology and virologists are now uh, agreeing. Which, of course, is uh, encouraging. Okay, thank you for watching.